divisions among you. You're quarreling and you're fighting. Don't be like them. But that's not who he uses. He doesn't say, don't be like uh, uh, Peter when he was maybe a little bit mistaken in his application of the Jewish law. He doesn't say that. He says, don't be like the first murderer in the Bible. Why does he jump back to Cain? I'm glad you asked. I was waiting for the The world hates you. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. Now, notice that phrase. He is not saying that we've passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. All right, the cause for passing is not the love for the brethren, but the love for the brethren is an indication that we have passed from death to life. All right, that phrase is very key to us understanding this passage. All right, we don't want to confuse that. Listen, if I love somebody, now I'm saved. But because I'm saved, I love the brethren. Because I'm saved, I love fellow Christians. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Lord, I thank you for this passage, for this time, Lord, already for the music tonight and what you're doing already in hearts. Lord, I pray you'd give me clarity tonight and direction as I speak. Lord, may our hearts be tender to your spirit and to your word. Lord, would you touch us tonight? In Jesus' name, amen. John makes some fairly bold statements in this passage. Statements that anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and no murderer has any part of eternal life. Statements like, don't be like Cain. He really makes some statements that at first reading and first glance kind of say, make you say, well, John, where are you going with this? You've kind of really made some big jumps. I'm not sure what you did. Years ago, there was a, a commercial, uh, like a, a viral commercial we kind of borrowed for our church revival. The commercials went something like this, like, like don't, uh, 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 don't miss revival. If you miss revival, all right, you'll get an accident. If you get an accident, all right, you'll, your car will blow up. If your car blows up, you'll stop the entire grid of the United States. You stop the entire grid of the United States, all right, the entire world will be gone. So don't miss revival. All right, things that just don't make sense together. And at first glance, if you look at this passage, it kind of seems at first glance that that's what John's kind of doing. Oh, John's doing those preaching things. All right, you know, be careful. Preachers really warn you, and they go way overboard, so you stay back here, but... John's just not just doing a preacher's thing because it's the inspired Word of God, right? So it's from the Holy Spirit. It's from God Himself. I want us to notice three things out of this passage tonight about the love of God and the expression of, of, our, of God's love in my life and in your life. An expression that, that God's love is not just supposed to be something that touches me, though it will touch me. It's not just supposed to be something that I sing about, that I get emotional about, though that should happen as well. There's supposed to be, according to this passage, an expression that stems, this foundation is found in the love of God in my life. The first thing I see, verses 11 through 15, is that love remembers. Love remembers. He says this, and he's been talking about the love of God. It's been no surprise. It would be no surprise if I said, listen, folks, now I'm going to talk about the love of God. He would not say, oh, the love of God. Never heard that before at First Baptist Church. The love of God, I wonder what that is. Now, there are some people who, if you said God loves you, they have never heard that before, right? And it would be brand new information for them. They wouldn't have any context. It would be mind-numbing and mind-blowing that the God of the universe loves me. But for you as Christians, if you've been here to First Baptist Church or been saved a little amount of time, you know that God loves you. Remember that John is writing to believers. Right? He's writing to other Christians. So it's not like they've never heard of this concept before. And so he dials them back on, a, on a, maybe a, a trip down memory lane. And he says this is a rudimentary concept, love one another, but it's not a new concept. 
You know, the world is trying to redefine what love is, right? And not what it means, but what it actually is. They grossly misrepresent what love is. You see, in the world's definition of love, a selfish, self-indulging decision. There is no place in the world's definition of love for God's love. And that's why they believe God must be self-serving inside of this. God is not self-serving. He is other-serving. It's true love, a selfless, sacrificial choice for others. We're in a time where the hashtag is love wins. Love wins, meaning you can love whoever you want, whomever you want to, however you want to, and that should be okay. That's what love's supposed to be. Love is supposed to be whatever you decide it to be, that's love. And no one should be able to tell you otherwise because you get to decide what love feels like to you. What a gross misrepresentation of what love is. That's not what love is, and that is not what God's love is. Love is selfless choice for others, and, and John says, you've heard from the beginning, right? This is not a strange concept. This is not a new concept. It is what you've heard that you're supposed to, and I'm supposed to, love one another. I want you to do me a favor, and I don't want you to point to somebody who is a one another. Go ahead, point. Find somebody who's a one another. Point to somebody else who's a one another. They're found really in this room, Right? We're supposed to love one another. Use all my fingers like that, right? That's one another. Do that. Do all the fingers, all right? All the one another. That's the one another's. So John says, listen, this is not a new concept. I want you to love one another, all right? And then he says, don't be like Cain, whose foundation, whose heritage, he says, was of the wicked one. Cain was of his father. He's referencing the devil. He says Cain, in his actions, not only was he uh, uh, exhibiting devil-like choices, but he was showing that he was of the wicked one. You see, Cain made choices and actions that reflected what was in here. Cain lived out, outwardly, what was inward. This morning, I hit this exact same concept and just how it happened. It must be what we need, that what is inside always comes out. What is inside always comes out, and it fits in perfectly with the previous six or seven verses. Sometimes hard to interpret in John, but, but what John is saying is what is inside, if you're truly saved, if you truly have God's love in your heart, it will come out, and if not, you'll be like Cain. You say, well, pastor, I would never be like pain, Cain. I would never have that kind of attitude in my heart. He goes on to say this, that, that hate is akin to murder. That hate is akin to murder. Now, this is no surprise because Jesus said the same thing in the book of Matthew. That Jesus said the exact same thing. John is not making up a concept. He's referencing the Savior. He said, listen, what's inside here will come out here with Cain. What was inside here was death and deceitfulness and destruction, and it came out. And it came out to the extreme where he murdered his brother. Abel's offense, the Bible says, his only offense, his actions were righteous. Only offense. No other offense. That's what he says. What was wrong with Abel and his brother's righteous because his own works were evil and his brother is righteous the only reason cain said that, that he made this final decision was because his brother did right and he was wicked from the inside out you say wow he goes on to say the next verse don't be alarmed if the world hates you don't be alarmed if you're misunderstood but it goes beyond that because he used that word, the world hates you. He is obviously referencing Cain's hatred for Abel. Okay, see how he connected those two things? Cain hated Abel and killed him. Don't be uh, marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. Don't be alarmed by this fact. Don't be surprised when the world doesn't just misunderstand you. 
but wants to destroy you. Now, we'll talk about what it looks like in 2020, but understand, for them, it was a real-world problem. These Christians were under persecution, not just for their beliefs, but for their very lives. Very lives. Can you not hear them saying, John, we trust God. We love the true creator. Why do they take my wife or my children or my husband? Why are we under such persecution? Why are we running for our lives? Why are we under such, such dire straits? Why is it so bad? And John says, don't marvel. Marvel not. Don't be alarmed if the world hates you. Because they have destruction and deceit in their heart. They're of their father, the wicked one. They're not even saved yet. Don't be surprised if they want to destroy you. The problem is that now in 2020, we should also not be surprised again. We should not be surprised if they want to destroy us. And what do we want to do? They want to destroy our belief system. They want to say, what you believe is a fallacy. It's fake. All right? there's, no, there's no God. There's no creation. They're trying to destroy what we believe in. There is no God of truth. There is just a God of myself. They want to destroy our worship. They want to destroy our children. They want to destroy everything about us. Have you not noticed in this current climate that the greatest sin seems to, have, seems to be having Christian beliefs? That someone would, would call the action of someone else wrong? Whoa! Whoa! You can't do that. All over the news, it seems like people are, uh, are <laughs> they're just bending to the will of the media, it seems like. And saying, oh, we'll separate ourselves from this particular man because he views a lifestyle as sinful from the Bible. We'll have no part in that. I do not agree with everything that Franklin Graham does, the son of Billy Graham. Obviously, we're on different pages but as far as I can tell, he preaches the gospel, as far as I can tell, and maybe other information. I read this past week that he has been canceled from his final venue in Europe. Every single venue that he was scheduled to be at for a crusade has been canceled because he believes that there are certain lifestyles that are sinful from the Bible. And he's willing to say that. Don't be surprised if the world hates you. Don't be surprised if your coworkers can't stand you. Listen, marvel not, brethren. Here's the problem, though. We have Christians, pastors, who have a real problem with the world hating them. So they're trying to redefine their beliefs and their churches. They're trying to redefine what this looks like because we can't have people hating us. And so, listen, we have to modify our message. We have to modify our positions. So, you know, but, but if, if, if they don't hate us, then we can slip in the gospel. Listen, I don't try to offend people, but I don't want to do that at the expense of diminishing the message of God's love with all of its purity and holiness. God's love comes in a few forms, just like a father's love comes in a few forms. I love my children, so I don't let them play with vipers. I love my children. So I try to guide them in the way that will help them be successful and productive. The way that will keep them from seriously injuring themselves. No, you can't jump off the top of the bunk and try to land on your neck. This is not a good idea. No, you can't take the butter knife and shove it in the outlet. This is not a good idea. Not because I hate my children, but I'm telling them their actions are wrong because I love them expression of God's love. Not only was it a rudimentary concept and a real problem, but there also it's a relational problem. Verse 15, he says this, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. Then he says, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. This is a tough verse. No murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Some will wrongly say, some will wrongly say that if a murderer cannot be saved, we know that is wrong. If that were true, the Apostle Paul would never be saved. 
There's no doubt in my mind that Paul will be in heaven. No doubt in my mind. David, never make it to heaven. So we know that, that he's not saying that. All right? You say, well, what are you saying? Well, I'll tell you this. I'm not exactly sure, but let me give you some thoughts about it. It's okay to not be exactly sure about something in the Bible. Sometimes the Bible is way above our thoughts. Okay? It's okay to say, you know what? I'm not going to try to make up an answer. I'm going to just tell you what it says. Here's his point of these, of these four or five verses. All right? What's inside comes out. And that a true Christian will not allow anger, wrath, and malice in their hearts toward other believers. That's what he says. If you hate your brother, you're like a murderer. And no murderer has any part or no life, eternal life abiding in him. He says, listen, if you're a Christian, if you claim to have the love of God in your life, then you and your heart will not have anger, wrath, malice, and bitterness toward fellow Christians. One another. You see, it's a relational problem. How many churches have been blown up because of bitterness toward other Christians? Well, you don't remember what they did to me, Pastor. You're right, I don't. And they probably don't either. When was it again? 30 years ago? 40 years ago? 50 years ago? Talking to someone once, a long time ago from this church. They said, well, I won't go there, a particular place. Why won't you go there? They said, because this person was mean to me 35 plus years ago. A little Bible phrase for you. Get over it. Where is that found? I don't know. You'll find it. Get over it. This is what John is saying. When you remember, you're going to be able to love one another. And you're not going to have this hatred in your heart. You're going to be able to come to church and fellowship with fellow Christians with a God love that comes from Him and flows through you. It says, I love you. And when you fail me like you will because you're human, I'll still love you. I'm going to love like God. When you disappoint me, like I know you will because you're human, that I'll still love you because I'm going to try to love you with a God-like love. And I'll ask that when I disappoint you, I fail you, that you return the favor. That's what John is saying. Well, pastor, you should know they are, they are so two-faced. They probably are. And so are you. They are fake. Do you hear yourself? Are we really having this conversation? Because they say that fake, you can just feel the, you can feel the poison dripping off their, their lips, can you not? Yeah. They'll never fill in the blank. See, it's a relational problem. John says, if you have the love of God inside here, what will come out is love one for another. And if you don't, then you're just like Cain, who was the first murderer. Now, Pastor, I don't think I'm like Cain. I didn't say it. John did. Don't take it up with me. Take it up with him. Because he equates hatred in a heart to murder, and that's what Jesus did. And he dialed it back to Cain. You see, love remembers. The Christian life begins and continues on the foundation of forgiveness. Not just on the promise of protection and help in a difficult world. The cross is a picture of violence, yet the key to peace. The cross is a picture of suffering, yet the key to healing. A picture of death, yet the key to life. A picture of utter weakness, yet the key to power. A picture of capital punishment, yet the key to mercy and forgiveness. A picture of vicious hatred, yet the key to love. A picture of supreme shame, yet the Christian's supreme boast. I won't glory in anything else save the cross of Christ and His love flowing through me toward fellow Christians. Lord, I thank You for Your Word. Lord, I don't know what's going on in people's hearts or lives. I'm just trying to preach Your Word, Lord. Lord, I wonder if there's someone here tonight or people here tonight who maybe have been struggling with love toward fellow Christians. 
Or maybe there's some bitterness, unforgiveness, some attitudes of anger and malice that really, Lord, have no place in our hearts toward fellow believers. Lord, help us to search our hearts. Would your spirit, spirit touch us? Lord, if there's an area that we've allowed to really have the dark, sinister glare of the world's spirit, that we would get that right with you tonight. Just a minute, piano will play. We'll stand to our feet. I wonder if tonight you need to remember God's love in your life. Have you been hurt? If you have, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you've been hurt. It's no excuse not to show God's love. John says, listen, God loves you, so show it. Lord, bless us at time of invitation. May we be honest before you in Jesus' name, amen.